You're listening to the Beyond Sundays podcast. Each week we talk to people just like you who share stories of God's faithfulness. It's week two of the Handle with Care sermon series here at Beltway, where we look at what scripture says about subjects, tough ones, like sexuality, gender, abortion, and politics. If you missed last week's episode on abortion or the sermon that Pastor David gave, I encourage you to go back and listen to those. As for today, we will extend the conversation from this past Sunday on gender identity. I'll link to that sermon in the show notes. What we did is we took a look at what the Bible says about gender. It has a lot to say. You know, the Bible identifies only two sexes, male and female, and we were created to reflect the image of God and reveal His heart in different ways. So how do women and men discover, embrace, and celebrate our uniqueness while also continuing to discover who God has created us to be? Today's episode is a tad unique as I sit down with two people at two different times, one male, one female, to talk about their journey in discovering their identity in Christ. So let's get started and we're going to go ladies first. All right, let's go. All right, I'm so excited to have a a friend in the studio today. I have Lindsay Spindler with me. Hello, Lindsay. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing really well. Well, this is take two, right? Yeah, it is take two. (laughs) Because we had a complication. We tried this yesterday, well, the day before today, and uh, couldn't get Lindsay's mic to work. And so anyways, long story short, finally got some help in that department and got it working and uh, decided that we were going to try this again the next day. So here we are, day two, and I'm really pumped about this conversation as we dive into what it looks like for us as God's children to bear His image on this earth. Because like we learned on Sunday, we are you know, created by God. We are His kids, and He created us male and female in His image. And so just talking about what does that look like? And so this kind of conversation is going to be a little bit unique because we're going to do this in two parts and uh, I'm going to get to talk to a a woman and a man and what it looks like to actually bear God's image and and how we do that uniquely because no one bears the exact same image of God as the next person because we're all so unique. And so anyways, before we dive into that conversation, Lindsay, I'd love for you to share a little bit about you. Sure. Well, I am not from the States. I grew up in South Africa, and I came to the United States when I was 18. Um, I came on a track scholarship to ACU, Abilene Christian University, and I stayed. <laughs> so <laughs> I've actually been in the States a lot longer now than what I was having grown up in South Africa. And so, and I'm married to a wonderful man. His name is George, and we are just living life. And what do you do? You teach? I do. I teach at Hardin Simmons University. I teach in the Department of Kinesiology, Health and Recreation. And um, yeah, I love teaching college students. It's it's one of the greatest gifts that I feel like the Lord has given me. That's beautiful. Well, they need strong professors and <laughs> need strong influencers in that you know stage of life just to be able to teach as people you know grow and learn and discover what their gifts are and what God's called them to do and. Um, university is such a wonderful time. So thankful that that you're here in Abilene and teaching at a great university. Yeah, go Cowboys. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I graduated from there too. All so right. love it. <laughs> love it. Well, uh, let's just dive right into our sure. discussion today on identity and gender and how those two things cross paths. I'd love to just start off the, the top with this question. What has it been like for you to discover what God meant when he created woman in his image. So when he created you as a woman, you know, another way of saying that might involve just discovering the things that God has uniquely p- placed in your heart um, that's different from other people because he made you uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully made, right? Yeah. And so how did you discover what role and the things that you were meant to do, like just as you've grown up, um, as you got married, just what that journey has looked like for you? Could you go into a little bit of detail on that? Sure. <clears throat> so I didn't grow up in the church, and um, but I grew up with two brothers, and so I'm the youngest of three. <laughs> so <laughs> the very last thing I wanted to do as as a sister was to wear dresses and go to ballet lessons. And so my mom actually tried to get me in ballet lessons, but I didn't want anything to do with that. (laughs) Um, I wanted to shoot guns, climb trees, and play with the boys. And so that's what I did. And, you know, I think at the time people would probably have said, well, you're a tomboy. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's what I enjoyed doing, right? Being outside and doing those things. Yes, exactly. But 
being a tomboy and having two brothers and wanting to do those things didn't make me male. Right. right. right? I was still a female. Um, it just made me really tough because I, I had two older brothers and they always say I was the spoiled one, but, you know, I had to stick up for myself, right? <laughs> the baby gets the bad rap, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> but I was also very athletic and I grew up, you know, competing. And, you know, honestly, my athletic career, I loved, 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 and I loved competing. And I, I believe that God gave me that gift to be athletic And it's that gift that allows me to sit in this chair today Mm -hmm. in Abilene, Texas, and do what I'm doing. Um, But my athleticism also didn't define me. That's right, yeah. Now, at the time, I probably might have thought that because I loved competing, absolutely loved it. I would would go and train versus go hang out with friends just because I loved it so much. Um, But it taught me competitiveness. It taught me persistence. taught me how to deal with losses. Um, and so my athletic career got me here to ACU, and I had some college roommates that helped me. I put those in, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, they helped me be feminine in a sense. And so a quick story, when I came to the U.S., you know, I'm coming from Africa. We don't really know what we're coming to. My mom packs, helps me pack my suitcase. And so one of the things she said, she's like, okay, you're going to need a purse. Now, you got to realize I was not the purse carrying girl, mm-hmm. all right? Like I didn't want anything to do with that, but I took my mom's advice, put a purse in my suitcase, got here to the United States. And my very first day in college, I'm looking out the window and I'm noticing like all of these college girls have a backpack and they got a purse. So I'm like, okay, well, this is great. I mean, <laughs> I've got this purse. I'm going to take it with me. I guess this is what you do in America. I don't know. So the first day of college, I go out and in my purse, I have nothing but a pen. Because I'm like, I don't even know what to put in a purse, okay? <laughs> so, just a pen. Yeah, That's all just you a need. pen. I was like, I don't really know. I've never really carried a purse, right? So I go, and I, and I probably did that for like two days, and we're like, oh, forget this. Just give me the backpack. You know, I don't yeah. need a purse. And so I just was not that feminine lady that had to be like everybody else, right. um, you know, and, and I ditched that and and just... When I say my college roommates helped me, like sometimes I'd get dressed and they'd be like, Lindsay, that does not match. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also came from a culture, you right? Did, where, yeah, different culture. Yeah, and we wore school uniforms. So, mm-hmm. you know, and of course, I didn't know anything. And so my roommates definitely helped me a whole bunch. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say, you know, being an athlete, you can be very competitive and you can be very aggressive. And I was on the field. I always wanted to beat whoever was I was competing against. And that's what you need to be a good athlete. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, but graduated college and uh, got married. And later on, um, I lost my first husband in a motor vehicle accident. And so in that moment, um, I got into a life group. And in that life group was much more mature believers than me, mm-hmm. much more mature women and men. And they really showed me. They didn't even have to say anything. Like, I just observed. I observed how they carried themselves. I observed how they interacted and had community. And I started to learn some more about what does it mean to carry my femininity mm-hmm. as a godly woman. Mm-hmm. That's um, good. You know, and, and they also taught me that you can be confident and strong as a woman and still be tender. That's good. So so learning those things from older women, you know, one of my recommendations is get with older women. Mm-hmm. You know, get with women who have walked with the Lord, who who know him and have spent time with him. And, you know, just, just spend time with them. And the thing is, I also learned not to compete and to compare myself to other women because That's the reality. So yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's so easy in this world, which is telling us to be this way or act this way to compare ourselves. Right. And the reality is God has created us uniquely. Mm-hmm. And when you don't compare and you ask the Lord, who am I? Tell me who I am, Father. Then we become and we know who he's created us to be. That's right. Because the reality is, Sarah, I need somebody like you. <laughs> and you need somebody like me. Absolutely. And if I'm, if I'm trying to be you and you're trying to be me, we're not accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. It's like two magnets, right? When you Mm -hmm. put the same uh, polar ends together, they bounce off each other. Instead, we need to be using each other's strengths, Mm -hmm. ultimately for God's kingdom. That's right. I love that in like 
the basic question, you, you alluded to this just a moment ago, is that we all ask is, who am I? Yeah. That is our basic, if you boil everything down to just the bare our bare soul. We yeah. are all asking that question, our whole culture, society, all around the world. That's the question that we're ultimately asking. And yeah. so to find that answer, like what you just said, we have to go to the source, the creator who created yeah. us for his glory, for his purposes on this earth, to be his kids, to bring his kingdom here, Yeah, you know, exactly. as in heaven, but here on yeah. this earth. And so... One, I love that. One thing I think that I would add, you know, because sometimes I think it's easy to say, well, you know, our identity is in Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think a key thing that you've said is how do we get there? Yes. Mm -hmm. And my journey with the Lord was absolutely spending time with Him, 100% time with Him. And sometimes it's easy to say, yeah, I'm with the Lord. I spent time with the Lord. But, you know, after my first husband died, I dove into spending time with Him and knowing him and reading the word and and asking him, who do you say I am? And what is your truth that defines me? And I'd never done that. Now, I'd been a believer since I was in college, but I'd never sat and purposefully and intentionally asked the Lord, show me, show me who I am. And just directing me in scripture and, you know, my life group in their wisdom, I would ask them questions and they would say, well, you get to ask the Lord about that. And honestly, I didn't know where to start reading the word, but I just started and I said, Lord, show me. And so praying and asking before I read the word, Lord, show me what it is you need me to see today. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, well, I haven't done that either, today's the day. Yeah, exactly. Do it today. Get yeah. in a quiet corner. Sit before the Lord. Maybe grab a journal if that's your thing or turn on some music or light a candle or whatever your thing is to help yeah. you get, turn off your phone, eliminate distractions, and just ask the Lord. Ask the Lord, yeah. who do you say I am? And teach me who you are. Yeah. Show me your ways. Reveal to me your heart, your nature. Show me your beauty. Because it is through our relationship with him yeah. that we discover who we are, who he made us to exactly. be on this earth. As we each uniquely express you know, parts of his character, parts yeah. of his nature to reveal who he is to people we come in contact with yeah. day in and day out. And something you mentioned earlier that I love that I want us to just circle back around again is your journey to being who you are and being the athletic person and being strong and confident in all of these places. Something that you mentioned earlier is that the Lord was tough and tender. Oh, yeah. Would you speak into that for yeah, just a sure. moment? Because it's so beautiful that, that there is a balance in that. And I even think about like characters in the Bible, like David. Yeah. David was so strong and mm -hmm. brave and bold. I mean, he fought lions and tigers and bears and all <laughs> the things, and, but he also played a harp. I mean, there's like, there's a balance, right? Yeah. So could you go into that just for a moment? Sure, sure. You know, I think one of the strengths that the Lord um, has given me is um, just to encourage women. And I love doing that, but I also know that sometimes that encouragement can come across as like really tough. But at the same time, God is tough mm -hmm. and not in a bad way. He, he desires goodness and righteousness for us. And so when we're in relationship, the Lord giving me that strength to encourage women uh, to be tough but tender at the same time. And I've been in situations where I have had to be tough, but then the Lord speaks and it's like, okay, hold back mm -hmm. and be tender. Um, so as, as women, we can be confident mm -hmm. and we can be tough, but at the same time, I also believe that God has placed in us tenderness. I would never have thought of myself as tender. I would have thought of myself as a tough and I can do all things, you know. Yes. <laughs> but there is that tenderness. And I always know when the Lord is, is working through me because I'm not a very emotional person. And when the Holy Spirit is speaking, I become very emotional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to switch gears just for a moment. And, um, you know, our culture is really confused oh, as yeah. a whole about a lot of things. Um, the darkness is just getting darker. But yeah. The light is getting brighter too. Yep, exactly. Like the Lord is advancing his kingdom in so many places, new places as well. And I'm so thankful for um, our church talking about these types of issues. But you're in the college sphere. You're in that 
age demographic where people are discovering, students are discovering, okay, what am I made for? What am I supposed to do with my life? That's the yeah. fundamental question they ask at 18. Mm-hmm. What am I yeah. going to do with yeah. my life? You know, and it's like <laughs> we have to have it all figured out. <laughs> Most of us don't yeah, exactly. when we're in that age range. But, you know, how, what is the world telling women? What are the lies that may be both overt and subvert that you're hearing kind of within our society and especially within that age demographic of like, What's being attacked as far as the feminine feminine piece and how sure. we carry that on this earth? Well, I think one of the biggest ones is you are you can be independent and you can do everything by yourself, and that is a complete lie. You know, our dependence should be completely on the Lord. Amen. And independence ultimately leads to isolation. Mm-hmm. And that was a big lesson for me to learn to be in a group of uh, women who taught me how to serve. Right. And we need each other. And so the enemy is lying to us saying, you can be independent and you can be on your own. The other thing that I, th- that I hear is you can be whatever you want and you can do whatever you want. And that's not true. We get to ask the Lord. Mm-hmm. And I was never told this when I was in college and, that, and, you know, going through school. But we do get to sit and ask the Lord, what is it you want me to do? One of the things I always tell my students is, I'll stand up in class and say, I know what your purpose is in life. And they kind of sit up and they look at me and I said, your purpose is to glorify the Lord in whatever it is you do. So if you are a physical therapist, glorify the Lord. If you are a CEO, you glorify the Lord. If you're a teacher, you glorify the Lord. It's not the glitzy answer maybe that they want to hear, but that is our purpose. Mm -hmm. And as women, we have strengths and we have gifts that we get to share with the world and we get to walk those out because the world is going to tell you, you need to be like Right. Well, right. that comparing piece yes. and the competing piece. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the world will also tell them, you have to meet a standard. The problem is the standard is a moving target. So when we get with the Lord and we know who we are in the Lord, He's our standard. Christ is our standard. Because He's the same yesterday, yes. today, and forever. Yes, exactly. So good. <laughs> so good. The other thing that I can add on that piece is... You know, we are taught as women in today's world that you can do everything a man can do. And God designed man and woman, and he said it was good. And the implication is that there are differences, and those differences are good. Yes. And I can speak from my experience. My first husband had a significant disability, and I had to do a lot of things that normally, you know, your husband or your boyfriend or your your spouse would do. And, and I did it because I loved him, and I had to. So I fixed wheelchairs, I changed wiper blades, I mowed the lawn, I did all of these things. And, and it's not a pity party, I did that. But I also know that there are things that I don't want to do as a woman, that I love that I can have a man step in and do those things. You know, walking through a crowded room with my first husband and having to ask people to move out of the way was a little tough. And now when I walk with George, he can lead the way. And for me personally, that is so um, refreshing to to know that I have a man that can help me. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I consider myself a woman that is um, educated. Um, and I want to speak to, I want to kind of go back to the independence piece because there is some level of independence if we, in, in reality, right? Right. So when my first husband died, I was thankful that I had an education to take care of myself. Right. But at the same time, I knew that I needed people in my life. And I need, I need men. I need their strength. I need their emotion. Mm-hmm. I need their thoughts. I need who they are as men. Okay, well, how do we as women, how do we defend the feminine heart of God that he's purposefully placed in us? Say, say that a woman is listening to this and she is feeling like, well, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable or confident in these places. and Or maybe she's been believing lies about what the Lord has placed in her sure. heart, and she's just unsure. If she's, uh, What would you say to women who are in that place and are asking those kinds of questions? Well, I think it goes back to spending time with the Lord. All right, so I'll start there. And the reality is you do have a gift, and you are talented, and the Lord has placed those things inside of you. Now, you may not know what those are. That's why you surround yourself with a community of people who say, I see this in you. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't surround yourself with people who are, gonna, who are not going to speak life into you. 
and they will call up those gifts and those talents and they will hold you accountable. But that accountability and calling up those gifts are going to make you that confident woman. So live out those gifts that he's given. And if you don't know what they are, try different things. You know, one of the things that I did, again, early on after I lost my first husband, I just decided I was going to just do whatever, not whatever. (laughs) There was a limitation on that. But when people said, hey, do you want to go on this vacation? Hey, would you like to try this activity? I would do that because I had to re-identify myself having lived 10 years, um, you know, with my husband. And and I stepped into some things that I wouldn't normally have. Like, I'm in scuba diving, right? <laughs> I'm assuming you, you're you not a scuba diver, are you? I, I, I was. I haven't in a long time. But it was challenging. It was something I didn't know how to do. And it was scary. And But I did it. And, you know, and I would go to, for instance, and maybe this is a crazy thing, but go to the movies by yourself. Go eat lunch by yourself. And and being uncomfortable so that I could get comfortable with who I was. That's good. And then getting to that place of contentment. And I truly believe that my time with the Lord prior to me getting married to George led me to a place of contentment. I knew who I was. That's good. I didn't have to be anybody else. I didn't have to pretend. I didn't have to put on a show. It was like, Lord, you're just showing me who am I. So sometimes it takes getting uncomfortable, (laughs) which none of us like, right? No. (laughs) I'm trying to think. I've never gone to a movie by myself. I've I know, never it's done pretty it. Pretty awkward at times. <laughs> I've never. I know people who do. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, good on you. That's awesome. Yeah. But I haven't done that yet. Yeah. I'm gonna try it someday. And I think back to you know my college days, and you go to the cafeteria, and you're like, okay, who am who I going to sit, sit with? with? Because people are going to think I'm weird if I'm by myself. And so I, I learned to overcome that because the reality is God has created me. I'm not alone. He is with me, and if I'm sitting at the table, he's sitting with me. That's good. And and the other piece that I that I would add, and I know this may sound a little weird, but you know, God is God, and I would often go into my closet and be like, Lord, what is it you want me to wear today? Because I didn't want to go wearing things that I felt like, oh, I have to wear this to fit in. Sure. I was yeah. like, Lord, what do you need? What do you need me to wear today? That is a good question. <laughs> That's really relying on <laughs> Holy Spirit in the moment to go, yeah, I care about what you're going to put on your body. Yeah, I yeah, do. I yeah, care. Exactly. And he does because yeah. he cares about the – we just talked about this just a moment ago before we hit record, but he cares about the little yes, silly things that he we does. would we would find, well, this is just ex- insignificant. This is minor. But he cares about even the minor details like yeah. – what am I going to wear today? Yeah. <laughs> Lord, help me decide. <laughs> and, I, and you know, we get, to, we get to love ourselves as women, which mm-hmm. is very difficult for us to do, mm-hmm. right? And yes. Stacey Eldridge from Captivating and, you know, listening to her, one of the things she said is stand in front of the mirror in your underwear and tell yourself, I love you. That's really uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> because ultimately we're, we are bearing the image of God. Mm-hmm. Right, And so when we say, I don't like myself, I don't love myself, we're denying what God has created. Mm-hmm. And, and I did that. And, you know, walking, there's, there's still parts that I think, oh, my gosh, like I could lose a few inches. It's a little soft here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I get to love who God's created. Yeah. And when, and when we can walk in that, then we can walk in the confidence of who we are. We can walk in our identity. And I think if we can get to the place as women to acknowledge the beauty in each of us. That's good. You know, because each of us are beautiful. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, there's some, when, you know, I could look at a woman and be like, wow, that woman is really pretty. Like, I know that there are women who are prettier than me, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I know there's women that are skinnier than me or stronger than me or smarter than me. But if I can look at them and say, man, that's a strength, and, and how can I partner with you? Versus, I just want to be like you. Right. Then I'm, I'm degrading myself. But instead, can I partner with you? How can we work together? Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I love that. Okay. Well, you have gotten married to <laughs> yes. George. Yep. And y'all have been married how long? Almost three years. Almost three so years. So we are newlyweds. You're still newlyweds. <laughs> well, one of the last questions I was going to ask you before we wrap up has to do with, you know, godly men 
and needing sure. godly men to be godly men and them bearing God's image as men, like how they were created to all uniquely, all individually. You know, the way one man reflects God's image mm-hmm. on this earth is different than another. Yeah. But we need men. We cannot replace men as women. We cannot yeah. do that. And I think our culture tries to say that we could or we should or we yeah. can. And that's just not true. Like we need men. We need fathers. Yeah. We need fathers to rise up and um, and we need men to rise up in business and in culture and all of these various places that they're that they are in. And so I'd love to ask you. Regarding the masculine heart, you know, God created man and woman and it was all good. The implication is that the differences are good. But I'd love for you to speak into that masculine piece as you've been married to George for three (laughs) years. Y'all compliment one one another in your marriage. You've grown, you know, each individually, but also together as you together bear God's image on this earth. So would you mind speaking into that? Sure, sure. As best I can. (laughs) Um. You know, I think in the past I probably would have said, well, a masculine heart is a man who can do things and is strong and can do whatever I need. And through the years, that has changed because I feel like that's kind of a foolish outlook because ultimately I'm saying, well, I'm going to depend on you instead of asking the Lord, I need to depend on on the Father, right? So to me, a masculine heart is a man who desires and seeks after the heart of the Father, and he loves the Lord, And he acknowledges his weaknesses. And one of the beautiful things that I love about George is, one, he's he's an emotional guy. I'm not. (laughs) We already established that. (laughs) But he's not afraid to show his emotion. Mm -hmm. And I always knew when we were dating, like, he was 100% real. And I needed to be with somebody who was 100% real. And so he was real. And I got to know who he was. And... I have faults, he has faults, but guess what? We partner together, and he has strengths that I 100% need, Mm -hmm. and I have strengths that he 100% needs. And I just love how the Lord has put us together because (laughs) when we did our premarital, we were on opposite ends on some of those items, but at the same time, they were so complimentary. So George is very task-oriented. I'm kind of like, eh, you know, we get it done, we get it done. But... He helps me stay on task, and I help him relax a little bit. So we complement each uh, each other, and so we partner really well. So to me, a, a masculine heart is is honestly a man who loves the Lord. And George will often say to me, what do you need from me today? And I'll say, just love Jesus. Because if I know that he is loving the Lord, then he's going to love me really well. The, the last question I always ask is if there are any resources for women who are wanting to to dive deeper into discovering who God made them to be as a unique woman, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, what resources would you recommend? Um, Captivating, of course, is a very good resource. Um, and as a woman, I would also highly recommend reading Wild at Heart. Nice. Because even as a single person, I read Wild at Heart because I wanted to know, okay, what – What are the desires of a man's heart? Mm -hmm. Captivating. You know, the very first time, I'm just going to put this caveat, the very first time I read Captivating, I was like, oh, this is so not me. (laughs) (laughs) Because she talks a lot about the wedding and dreaming of weddings. And I was like, I never did that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But the second time I read it, I was in a much more mature place. And I began to realize it's the Lord pursuing me Mm -hmm. as a daughter and as a bride. And then it started to make sense. So if you pick it up and you're like, I'm not that kind of woman who does the wedding dress, wedding planning, know that that is the Lord pursuing you, pursuing who your heart is as a woman. And then the other one, the other resource was Lisa Bevere, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, uh, Lisa Bevere has a lot of great yeah. books out there and yeah. resources. Um, there's The Fight Like a Girl. There's yeah. Lioness Arising, which mm-hmm. is discovering your purpose and just like – rising up into who God's called you to be as a woman, as a mother, as a fierce nurturer, all those things. And so I'll I'll probably, I will absolutely link everything in the show notes to all of these resources so women can dive deeper. The one thing that that I would add on purpose, because I think sometimes we think, well, I have to, we we get a lot of anxiety thinking I have to know my purpose. But the reality is if you're a stay-at-home mom, there is absolute 100% purpose. And you are just as valued as a woman who is a CEO. Amen. And so your purpose, again, is to bring God's kingdom to earth wherever you are. 
in whatever it is you're doing. So we don't have to stress about, I need to know, I need, like, what you're doing right now is God's purpose. Amen. And so today, ask the Lord the question, Lord, how can I reveal who you are where I am today? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time and wisdom. I love all your stories. Can't wait to have you back. All right. Thank you very much. Well, hey, everyone. I'm so excited to have a family member in the studio with me today. I have my bro-in-law, my brother-in-law, Kelly Gilgenbach. Hey, I Kelly. I am here in the flesh. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Kelly? I'm so glad you're here. Man, we go way back, don't we? Yeah, we do. I I was reflecting on that this week. It's It's crazy to think probably well over a decade, if not close to two decades, getting into that range where yeah. we've been serving together and now come full circle from camp counselors yes. to... In BSM camp. Yes. <laughs> and now you're my sister-in-law. I'm married to your sister, Katie, and that's really awesome. Yeah. And you have two beautiful children. Why don't you tell a little bit about you guys for just a minute or about you? <clears throat> sure. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm married to my wife, Katie, who is your sister. Very thankful for that. I don't often give Jeffrey credit for kind of connecting us, so I will at this point in time. So he set us up on a little date. He'll be so happy with this credit. I will. I refuse to give him credit, but today he's getting credit. <laughs> it's a special day. And uh, happily married uh, for 10 years, two kids. It's been awesome. And grew up uh, in, I would say, a normal great household. And somewhere around my junior high, high school years, our family unit got a little dis- disrupted. My dad stopped being probably the dad he wanted to be. He had cancer. Um, things got rough around the house. And I had to learn what it meant to be a man because I was a new Christian. My, we didn't grow up in a house that followed the Lord. And luckily, God put people in my life that helped to mentor me and show me that and, and steward their time towards showing me what it meant to be a man. And I've got a long list of people. Um, but that's a little bit about me. I work here in Abilene and love it. Yeah. Well, I'm thankful that that you are here having a conversation with me today. I asked you kind of last minute, and I really appreciate the time you've just sought the Lord on this topic, because we're going to talk about just kind of what you mentioned about um, like that identity piece of who we are. You know, Pastor David is in the middle of a sermon series where we're discussing uh, some hard topics, and this last Sunday, he talked about gender identity, which is huge, because it's the number one question all humans ask is, who am I? And the Bible has an answer to that, and it is that he, the Lord, has created us male and female in his image, and we are to reflect him as, like, I am supposed to reflect him as female, you reflect him as a male, and what does that look like? So I invited you here today to kind of get a just an idea from you, I mean, of what that's looked like in your life to reflect the heart of God, especially since you learned those things later in life and through, like you said, mentors that were in um, in your life in high school and college and beyond. And I'd love for us just to kind of open a discussion, a dialogue about what that has looked like. So for you, what does it look like to discover what God meant when he created man in his image, when he created you as his son? How? What does that journey look like for you? It's been a long one, yeah. but a good one. Yeah. So as I mentioned, um, my parents were great and kind of exiting me living at home, getting into college, first becoming a believer, not knowing exactly what that looked like. Um, there were men in my life who helped to help me understand what was my purpose as a man. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the world will tell you, they give you all these images of what a man should look like. Right. And some of those things are, they're, they're great. Like, sure. you want a big mustache? Awesome. You want tattoos or a truck? Cool. Go for it. (laughs) But um, what I had learned and what I think a real man looks like biblically um, is that we serve. Mm -hmm. Like So a lot of times if we forget who we are, we stop serving. And this is seen in our culture all the time where it's have it your way. If it doesn't make you happy, don't do it or find something else. And you're told you need to be strong, uh, make money, have women, um, and that... It's all about you. Mm -hmm. And men serve, Jesus served. I think that's the example that I'm constantly trying to remind myself is as a man, we have to serve. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came 
not to be served, but to lay down his life and serve. That's right. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And luckily enough, I had plenty of mentors along the way that helped kind of instill that into me. And then just by going to church, yeah, learning that. Well, and getting around a faith community where you saw it not necessarily just being taught, but you also caught it because you were around the people that were modeling it, just as you said. Yeah. And so I had, I had to participate in that as well. I think right. God put those people in my life, um, but the responsibility was on me too to continue to pursue those mentors or pretend, continue to get in to church community or small groups and have those things be instilled in me and I can learn those things. Mm-hmm. So just first and foremost, you, you've got to have Jesus as the example of what biblical manhood looks like, and he's the perfect example of that on earth. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be more like a man, or uh, you want to be a man, a true man, a biblical man, look to Jesus, understand Jesus, get in community, read the word, and you'll start finding that Jesus is laying down his life and he's coming with a purpose to serve people. That's right. And if you don't have that community, if you don't have those types of mentors that Kelly is talking about, or if your son, if maybe you're listening to this and you have a son who's a teenager or a preteen or whatever, and they don't have a father figure in your life, I want to, I just want to shoot the question to you, Kelly, what would you say to those people? How would you encourage them to go out and find that community? How important is it? Well, because it's super important, it's worth exploring different avenues. So hopefully you've got you know, friends that you could ask that you feel comfortable with. If not, that's why Beltway is a great place to get plugged into. You can come here and there's plenty of resources and that is what the body of Christ does is it helps each other out. And that's, this will be my uh, call to action here for everybody. If you're looking for that and you need someone, you're welcome to call or email me and I'll help you get plugged in somewhere (laughs) here at Beltway or somewhere outside of Beltway. But it's, and there's seasons to this as well. Mm-hmm. There were seasons where there was a certain guy in my life who mentored me, and there's the seasons where other people mentored me. And mm-hmm. there's people that mentor me in different things. So it's not right. just one person. Yeah, because you're being life. mentored just not only in faith, but also in business, in family. I mean, I know I, because I'm close to you, I know the type of people and the kinds of people that you search out and seek um, godly counsel from in all these different avenues. And so I think that that's, that's awesome. Well, and here's the other challenge too for the for men that are out there that are uh, serving well, find someone that you can mentor, mm-hmm. because those people had an invaluable impact on my life, um, and because they sacrificed some of their time, money, resources, I am now in a position where I'm at to help lead my family, mm-hmm. lead my kids, mm-hmm. lead people that are around me at work. And if they wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be in a position to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're all connected together. Yeah. So give me a little bit, just let's go a little, a level deeper when it comes to the things you learned from this group of men who are um, basically like father figures in your life, mentors, as you've said, what else did you learn? What else did you you glean from watching them, talking to them about what it looks like to be a biblical man? Yeah. Yeah. So keeping it really simple, I've got I got two areas. One is I think men love, and men also lead. Uh, so we'll dive into that just a little bit here. Uh, obviously, as a man, you want to love well, uh, and if you're married, that means you love your wife well. If you have kids, it means you love your kids well, uh, and this kind of transpires or plays itself out in protecting them, providing for them, pursuing them. And it's not about you. It doesn't have to be about you. And again, back to what the world says is if you believe that, then you, you're you selfish and you're going to have marital problems or you're going to be selfish and your kids aren't going to get what they need. Yeah. Um, so, uh, And then leading, just I believe that men are the head of the household and what does that look like? I think that's a lot of times when we hear that, we hear there might be some negative thoughts, but God loved us and he was he – was, the head, but mm-hmm. he loved us so much that he he does those things to he sacrifices. Yeah. He sacrifices. So the other aspect of this is just leading as a man, and we I look at that as uh, I have a responsibility to be the head of my household, and that doesn't mean that I get to tell my my wife or my kids what to do, and they have to listen to me. It means that I I love them so well that I'm res- I'm ultimately have this responsibility 
Mm -hmm. to be the head of the household and make decisions that will impact our family and lead them into the things that God has for them, Mm -hmm. rather than just hoping everything works out. Yeah. Well, as I'm hearing you say this, I'm I'm also, because I know you, I know that you're leading from a place of being submitted to the Lord in these areas. Um, Wherever you're leading your family, wherever you're leading in business, wherever you're leading at work, you're leading under the submission of Christ because of just like what you said earlier, you're serving him first. You're seeking him first in all things so that you can then lead in all these other places as a man, right? As a man who's reflecting the heart of our amazing, incredible father here on this earth. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And it's it's difficult being a, a, a man. Yeah, uh, in, in, in this culture. In this absolutely. culture and just doing it well. And... That's why community, mentorship, being plugged in, all these things are necessary to do that because we want to fight for – we want we want to be good stewards of what we've been given. That's the other thing I put down is good stewards, and we want to be – we initiate things. So mm-hmm. part of what we do as men is we initiate things when it's with our spouse, so we pursue them. We do these things. We initiate things with our kids because we're the head of the household, and we want to teach them in the ways that they should go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we're not careful, again, we just put put it back on us and we focus on us uh-huh. and that get, we drift off and we do what we want instead right. of doing what, submitting to what God wants, yeah. which is always so much better. Mm-hmm. It's so much more life-giving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the, I'm reminded of that scripture where it talks about laying our life down. You know, we can we can gain the whole world, but what has it profited? Yeah. You know, but when we lay our lives down for the sake of Jesus and his ways and his kingdom, man, I mean, talk about fruit. I mean, there's just no end to it. So bef- I'm going to switch gears on you because you mentioned um, about what the world is, is teaching. And so I would love from your perspective, you're a dude, what is the world saying? What lie is like in general do men believe? Could you like sp- like just get down to the specifics of that lie? Like what are men believing as far as when it comes to identity? Men are believing, again, I think at the core level that – they have to do all these things first. Um, so they replace, they put the doing first instead of the being. Oh, that's good. They forget who they are. Mm-hmm. Or again, the world tells us you have to have this product. Mm-hmm. You have to act this way. You have to do these things in order to be a man. Mm-hmm. Instead of us understanding our identity in the Lord and from that place walking in our sonship so that we can do the things that we need to do that's in alignment with God's will. Mm-hmm. So replace anything. I mean, just you. in order to be a man, you need a big truck. You can't wear Uggs. I've got several <laughs> pairs of Uggs, just disclaimer here. And uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that that disqualifies me from being a biblical man. They're just comfortable. Okay. But we've got to keep our eyes on who we are in the Lord. That's the first thing. And it will be a daily struggle, and you have to get in, into that place every day Amen. knowing who you are. That's right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think we have to keep going back to the Lord and, and His presence and asking Him just the flat-out question, Lord, you tell me who I am. You tell me who I am in this situation. You give me eyes to see what you're seeing that that maybe right now I'm blinded to this. I can't see it because of I'm I'm confused or I just have so much feeling like pressure. I mean, is that something that men typically like that that's a reason that they might like hold back is is that there's so much pressure on men to perform and to be and to do. Do you see that? Oh, absolutely. And it's part of it's built into us is mm-hmm. we want to provide and we want to protect and we want to serve. And sometimes we do that out of our own strength and it gets really tiring. Yeah. So we need to do those things. Those are built into us. They're strong dispositions of a man. But if we're, again, we can confuse that too by doing it by ourselves. Right. And God didn't create us to do it alone. That's right. Yep. So um, men do it together. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to, I'm going to ask you a question because you have... My sweet little nephew, his name is Hunter, and I want to talk about him for a minute because, like, I was raised in a house full of girls. My dad is amazing that he put up with all of us um, and was a wonderful father. I mean, incredible, but uh, 
Jeffrey, my husband, was the first son in the family. You were the second son in the family. And then, uh, you know, my sister is now married to her spouse. And so love, love Jesse and Julianne. But uh, Hunter is the first grandson, the first nephew on our side of the family. So I would love, we're all like giddy and super love Hunter. He's just brings so much joy and life and fire to our family and family dinners. But I'm, I'm going to ask you, how are you teaching him at three years old how to be and reflect the heart of God as a young man, as a boy? What are you doing different? Great question. And <laughs> It it goes back to what we've talked about a little bit here. So I call him Hunter Boy yeah. all the time. I just I'm speaking his identity over him. We all do that, by the way. So his, like his, nickname. his name is Hunter Boy. Yeah, because he's a boy, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's really interesting. So my first child or our first child is Parker Rose. Mm-hmm. She's the daddy's little girl, and I love her. But she's then super precious. <laughs> Hunter came into my world, and mm-hmm. it's fun because he likes trucks and punching things and. You just see these such clear distinctions between my daughter and my son. Mm -hmm. Um, But but with both of them, and particularly him, it's just continuing to let him know who he is, teaching him things. Like, again, when he disrespects Katie, Mm -hmm. my wife, that's not okay. We got to teach him. It's not okay to disrespect women. It's Mm -hmm. definitely not okay to disrespect your mom. And so if he does that, there's going to be things that he has to do to make up for that. Right. Oh, and he's got to go own up and apologize because men, uh, they go and when they make a mistake, they clean up their messes. And I've also heard you say, and this goes back to what we talked about earlier, but you then you ask him, how can you serve your mom? Yeah. I've heard you do that. When he's been disrespectful for some reason, you'll you know walk with him to Katie and he'll ask for forgiveness. He'll say, I'm sorry. And then I've often heard you say, well, how are you going to serve your mom? Let's figure out a way to serve your mom. And I think that that goes right back to that that piece that you mentioned earlier of being a servant. Like, let's be servant-hearted just as Jesus was. And that's how you're practically doing that with a three-year-old, you know? Yeah, yeah it's fun. Every day is an adventure. So. Right. Well, and that's something that boys, I mean, guys love, adventure, right? You're That's built into you too. So He is allowed to pee in the backyard. <laughs> Girls don't do that though, but my... My three-year-old son does, so that's okay. <laughs> now, he's awesome. And even when he's not in trouble, it's trying to guide him and let him know ways that he can serve, mm-hmm. that he can protect, that he can provide. Even as a three-year-old, how does he do that? And so we'll teach him that young mm-hmm. so that he knows how to do it when he's old. I love that because you're training your children both up and you know differently because you've got a boy and a girl. So the way you parent, the way you speak to, the way you call up, each of them are different. I mean, it is that way with, I have two girls. It's that way with both of our girls and they're the same gender. The way we parent them and talk to them and all that stuff, discipline is going to be different with either one of them. And so I love that you're training in, them in the way that they should go so that as they grow up and as they become oh, teenagers someday, you know, and they start having these questions like we all do when it, and not even, probably even before then, a lot of students are having these questions a lot younger, a lot younger these days. But as we're teaching our children and training them up in the way that they should go, you know, our prayer and our, that we believe in faith that they will not depart from it. And so that's just that proactive, like, let's train our kids. This is who you are. You are a son. You are a daughter. You're my daughter. You're my son. But you're also, you know, a son of God. I love that too. The other thing we try to do with Hunter is, or just, I just think it's important to mention this, is Hunter has different competencies and and natural things that God has gifted him with that Parker does not. And some of those things would even appear to be less manly. Like he's a sweetie pie. He is a sweetie. Parker is much more assertive on certain things and is wired a little bit differently but that's not – we're leaning into those things rather than trying to correct him from being tender. um, tenderhearted. Yeah. Like, that's great. Let's grow that tenderheartedness because we see that there are men after God's heart in the Bible that's right. that were tenderhearted. That's right. And so I'm not telling him, hey, don't cry. Don't have emotions. I'm leaning into those things and guiding those things as long as he's still serving and understanding who Jesus is. That's good. And I think that that goes back to what Pastor David said on Sunday about how – you know, we as a church, we really need to broaden what our what the expressions of each gender are and can be, because you're right. Like, I mean, David of old, 
was a manly man. He fought bears and lions. I mentioned this earlier in the, the previous conversation with Lindsay, but he also played a harp, you know? He also had a pair of Ugg boots. <laughs> you cannot confirm nor deny that David of old had a pair They were sheepskin, of... and they were okay, amazing. Okay, okay, all right, you win. <laughs> well, I'm just going to throw this one out there because I did ask this question with Lindsay, um, and I want to ask it to you, pitch it to you, but I want us to, to, to switch gears real quick and talk about the feminine piece because you grew up with a sister, you had a mother, you now have a wife, you have a daughter. Like, what are your thoughts? What are you praying into? I would just love to discuss the fact that, you know, our culture, we need women to rise up just as we need men to rise up into their God-given identities as both men and women, right? Fathers and mothers, whether you have biological, biological children or you do not have biological children, just as you needed spiritual fathers in your life at a certain time and still do to this day have mentors that you seek out and that you have invested in your life. Like we need mothers and fathers to rise up, brothers and sisters to rise up. So let's switch gears and chat about the feminine piece just here just for a moment. I'd love to have your thoughts on that. About what does it look like to like for women to express the feminine heart of God here on this earth? I'm no expert in this, so I'm going to give it my best shot, though. <laughs> Don't expect you to be uh, an expert. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I, I'm thinking about this. I think because God created men and women uniquely, mm -hmm. they complement each other, and there's a tension that's created. And when there's tension, there's a little bit of strength. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's not, it's not so much that... Uh, Men or women should be, I would say, let's say physically stronger, or there's one that it makes more money and provides more. Those are just competencies, but the disposition is like women are do a great job of taking care of the family. Like mm -hmm. my wife does a great job of caring and loving on our family and making it an environment that our kids want to be in and that I want to be in. It's not necessarily about these competencies, these things that who brought home the biggest paycheck, who's stronger, who's whatever. It's these dispositions within our heart that God has put there uniquely for men and women mm -hmm. that we are to express and call out. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately when you look at men and women, because they're created differently, they complement each other, but they're also very different. And that difference creates some tension, which ultimately creates strength mm -hmm. for the, the body of Christ, for a family unit. Yes. And that's the beauty of it. So I it's okay that. that men and women are different. They're supposed to be. They're supposed to be. Yes. And because we're going to go back to the first thing we do as men is serve, when we see those differences, we, we pursue those things gently and lightly, and we take them and incorporate them into our family and into our marriages and into the things that we want uh, to do in the community. All relationships. Yeah, all relationships. All relationships. Yeah. I love that. Well, Kelly, if there, uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to ask you one last question. Actually, two. Sorry, I lied. Are you going to forgive me? Make it three. <laughs> one, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to make sure we talk about before we sign off? I think just a challenge. I always like to have some kind of like call to action. Right. You a know, take home. I'm yeah. in sales and marketing, so let's get a, a CTA or call to action. My challenge to anybody listening would be, Find a way that you can grow uh, into the identity that God has for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure how to do that, go ask someone. Mm -hmm. Go find someone that maybe you can uh, ask to coffee and, um, you know, have them mentor you. Have yeah. have them teach you something that you admire about them and grow into what you need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, That's good. And be being the person you need to be rather than doing all these things that the world tells us to do. Let's be who we're called to be first, and out of that, <clears throat> we'll walk life. And then the other challenge is to those that are walking well, go find someone that you can pour into for a season. That's good. So yeah. steward your time well and run the race well, and that's something that I felt convicted this last year, and there's uh, two guys at work now that I'm walking with in a intentional relationship on a weekly basis to encourage them, challenge them, teach them things that I wish I would have known when I was their age. Or even if their age is irrelevant, if you've got wisdom that you can give, then give it. Freely you've received, freely give. There you I go. love that. I love it. Well, Kelly, thanks so much for joining us today. The last question I'm going to ask is if there are any resources you'd recommend. 
for people mm. to go deeper. Resources. Um, I have resources I think has been really great. We recently went through a sermon series by, um, or that was from Leif Hetlin. It's called The Rain. Yeah, that And book. that's the concept mm-hmm. of be, have, do. And mm-hmm. a lot of Christians are walking life, doing it on their own, and they're putting the do first. Mm-hmm. So even if you know who God is, you're feeling your tank depleted. Yeah. You're doing, doing, doing so that you can try to have what you think you need to have so you can be who you need to be. And so a, the, it's the formula is the opposite. It's let's, let's understand who you are as a man or as a woman of Christ. Right. And that's a great resource for that. So yeah, I agree. If you didn't, if you weren't a part of that sermon series, go back and watch it or get the book and read through it. It's excellent. Yes. Another one I would say would be, um, isn't it Wild at Heart by John Absolutely. Eldridge? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And Foundational I think. Foundational for men. I think he has like a whole website where you can actually go and click on videos that of things that he's taught when it comes to the heart of a man and what men long for and a lot of the things that you've mentioned today. You know, we, we have this short conversation and it's like what Pastor David said on Sunday. It's like there's so much depth to all of this and there's so much that we can learn and glean from so many different resources. But this is just a really, really, really high view, a really like scratch the surface conversation. And I really appreciate, Kelly, you coming in today and having this conversation with us and just sharing your life and sharing your testimony of, of, of just learning what it looks like to live a life that is submitted to the authority of Christ in your life, but then walking in your kingdom identity as a son first, as a man of God. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was fun. This was fun. It's awesome. I'm so thankful for both Lindsay and Kelly for sharing their journeys with us while offering both wisdom and encouragement. Isn't it fun how they each said similar but different things? I loved how they talked about the role that older men and women have played in their lives as they saw their mentors walk out what it looks like to be a man of God or a woman of God. And just like they said, you know, ultimately, as we ask the question, that fundamental question, who am I? Both of them said the exact same thing. We have to go to the source. So ask the Lord, Lord, who do you say I am? And let him speak into how you uniquely carry the heart of God this side of heaven. You know, each one of us was created beautifully and wonderfully, whether you are a male or a female. Yes, you, you were created beautifully and wonderfully. And we need both genders. We need each other's strengths. So when you see strengths in others, I encourage you to call them out. Oh, it blesses people when we can encourage one another. All right, for a list of resources and links to the things we discussed in each conversation, head to the show notes. Thanks so much for listening to the Beyond Sundays podcast. We hope you'll have a wonderful day. And remember, God is moving all the time. And he's moving in your life too, beyond Sundays.